The Walt Disney Company has always been well known for their stellar animation. From early shorts to full-length features, they really set the bar on what the medium was capable of. However, Walt was reluctant to get into television animation. He knew it would be a strain on his resources, and finances were often a challenge during his lifetime. There were several points when the idea was proposed to stop doing animated movies altogether. TV would just add to the stress. Not only that, but TV animation generally had to stretch their budget across an entire season, which Walt knew would cut into the quality of his studio's work. While shows like the Mickey Mouse Club and the Walt Disney Presents Anthology series did have some new animation, they were largely live-action, or reused previously animated footage. It took until the mid-80s for the company to actually start producing original animated series. On this film's retrospective entry, we're going to be looking at their first two series, The Wuzzles and Adventures of the Gummy Bears. We'll also check out the unsold pilot for a potential third series, Fluffy Dogs. It's no secret that the cartoons from this time were heavily driven by merchandise. The Care Bears and My Little Pony had already debuted with standalone specials by 1984 and were gearing up for theatrical films and full TV shows. This was the era of bright, colorful, marketable animals, and Disney was following suit. Their first two animated TV series would premiere in September 1985, one after the other. The first show to air, The Wuzzles, was actually in production before the second one. It was co-produced by Hasbro, which again shows how toy-driven these things were back then. The Wuzzles takes place on the island of Wuzz, where everything is mixed up. The Wuzzles themselves are combinations of different animals. Our heroes included Butter Bear, who was a bear and a butterfly, and Rhinoki, a monkey rhinoceros hybrid. It wasn't just the animals that were combined. Machines, buildings, foods, and even their weather followed the same logic. They ate food like coconut melons, and had to watch out for tropical fruit storms. I don't know whether to applaud the cleverness of that joke or roll my eyes. In the spirit of the Wuzzles, I'll do both. The Land of Wuzz seems like a pretty fun place, but nowhere is for your problems. Three rotten appleberries stand out in the series as our first TV villains. Croc, Flizzard, and Brat. Croc is short for Crocosaurus, and appears to be a crocodile dinosaur combination. Voiced by Alan Oppenheimer, Croc was first designed as King Croc. Concept art and early storybooks show a larger, more threatening-looking character with a crown. He had a whole gang of evil wuzzles helping him, called the Creeposaurs, but this was all toned down in the TV show. Croc was a little smaller, and while he still looked plenty mean, he didn't come across as nearly as intimidating. His gang was whittled down to two henchmen. Croc causes the good wuzzles plenty of headaches, but he's not the most threatening villain out there. Ultimately, he's a small-time con artist, and would probably prefer it that way. Going big time would be far too much work. Although Croc is classified as a crocodile dinosaur, I'd say there's a good bit of sloth in him as well. He considers work to be a four-letter word. Well, I mean it is, but... Uh, you know, Croc, I am so hungry, I'd even go to work! Wait, wait a minute. Work? Where'd you learn that disgusting word? Did you pick that up on the street? Croc lives in an old, shambling houseboat, and usually waits for the right opportunity to arise for a scam. Sometimes it's as simple as stealing Butterbear's umbrella on a rainy day. Other times it's more elaborate, like pulling a Scooby-Doo routine to scare the Wuzzles out of a ghost town that he wants to dig for Golden. Nothing Croc's done has been truly life-threatening like some main villains, but I'd say most Wuzzles would be a lot happier if he moved away. Even on a smaller scale, every main villain needs a sidekick or two. Croc's closest ally is Flizzard, half-frog, half-lizard, voiced by Brian Cummings. Flizzard is the ultimate yes-man. What he lacks in initiative, brains, and backbone, he makes up for in agreeability. Whatever plan Croc hashes, Flizzard is ready to help. He doesn't have any qualms with harming the other Wuzzles, but at the same time, he doesn't really have much against them either. We never really see any interactions he has with the good guys when Croc isn't around, but I imagine they'd actually be somewhat pleasant. Flizzard is a born follower. He just wants to please Croc. Never mind that Croc treats him terribly. Without someone to obey, I feel like Flizzard wouldn't know what to do with himself. Still, if Croc ever decided to one day be a kind, generous Wuzzle, Flizzard would follow him without question. Okay, he'd probably have a few questions, but no real objections. Croc's other henchman is Brat, a cross between a dragon and a wild boar, voiced by Bill Scott. Brat is a pretty obvious riff on the Looney Tunes' Tasmanian Devil. He speaks almost entirely in grunts and snarls, though you can occasionally make out a word or two. Like Taz, he's mostly driven by his id. He has an even bigger appetite than the gluttonous Croc, and can get downright scary when he's angered. 
Even Croc can't take him in a fight if he's pushed too far. In spite of this, Brat is actually a little smarter than he looks. He's not a spineless passive helper like Flizzard. When he feels he's been ripped off by his boss, he'll make his feelings known. Brat's biggest moment comes in their My Fair Lady pastiche. Croc bets Butterbear that she can't make Brat into a proper gentleman. It really does seem impossible at first, but Butterbear is the kindest, most gentle Wuzzle there is. With that kindness, she's actually able to calm him down for a little while. All he really needs is someone to care about him. Lo and behold, Croc cares too. Although he does sabotage Brat's gentleman persona to win the bet, it's also because he misses having a little monster around. Yeah, you heard me, I missed you. There's not much Croc material I found outside of the show. I mentioned the storybooks with the early version of King Croc. One of them also featured a much more evil version of Flizzard. He is still described as being Croc's main henchman, but this Flizzard is the one to come up with all their nasty plans. He actually comes across as worse than Croc and the other Creepasaurs. A small handful of Wuzzle comic stories were published as well. A few show Croc as being an overt thief, trying to rob a bank or break into someone's house, complete with a burglar mask. There's definitely a contrast to the TV Croc, who is generally more of a huckster. He'd steal something if the opportunity presented itself, but he rarely went out with that in mind first. One short comic actually showed a rare instance of kindness. Croc disguises himself as a wishing well and charges food for wishes. He also did this in one of the episodes, but the outcome here is different and surprisingly sweet. Butterbear makes a wish on Croc's behalf, which actually makes the old lizard regret his actions for once. After the other Wuzzles have left, he makes wishes for them in the real wishing well. It's too bad that his one truly good moment is hidden away in a comic barely anyone's read, but Croc would probably prefer to keep that a secret. Despite its importance to Disney history, the Wuzzles is generally forgotten today. It's never had a video release in the US, and as of this date, it hasn't been added to Disney+. It's not a bad show, but it feels rather run-of-the-mill. Aside from the better-than-average animation, it ran along the same lines as other shows from the time, the Care Bears, the Get Along Gang, etc. Gummy Bears, as we'll see in a moment, was the show that really set the bar for what Disney was capable of with their TV shows, and paved the way for future successes like DuckTales, Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, and even Gargoyles. Enough beating around the gummy berry bush. Let's look at the reason most of you are here. Duke Igthorn, the Ogres, and the rest of the villains lurking around Gummy Glen. Adventures of the Gummy Bears was conceived by Michael Eisner. The former CEO has been the butt of a lot of jokes over the years, although I think many of us have come to appreciate him a little more as of recently. That being said, he had some pretty crazy ideas, and this was one of them. The series was indeed inspired by the Gummy Bear Candy. The real credit belongs to the creators Jim Magon and Art Vitello for developing such a silly concept into a genuinely fun show, but let's not forget its sugary roots. Gummy Bears has a much deeper lore than the Wuzzles. It takes place in the medieval kingdom of Dunwin, where these magical bears once lived peacefully. At some point in the past, greedy humans after the Gummy Secrets drove the bears into hiding. Many fled to lands unknown, and a few stayed behind, hidden out of sight. As the series picks up, only six bears remain in the kingdom, their secrets lost to time. They befriend Cavan, a young squire who longs to be a knight someday. Cavan agrees to keep their existence a secret, and it generally stays that way. Ogres, trolls, dragons, and many other mythical creatures exist here, but these bouncing bears seem to be too much for the average person to believe in. Most humans are unaware of our heroes, but one of the big exceptions is the main villain, Duke Igthorn, voiced by Michael Rye. Once a noble knight, the Duke got too ambitious and tried to take over the kingdom. Now he's disgraced and living in exile in the wastelands known as Drekmoor. But don't worry, Igthorn isn't alone. He has an army of ogres working for him, all of them ready to help their precious Dookie take over Dunwin. He's tried a number of magical items, weapons, and disguises, but his go-to plot involves the gummies. This is because he wants their secret weapon, the Gummy Berry Juice. This special potion famously allows the bears to bounce here, there, and everywhere. When a human or ogre drinks it, they get a brief burst of incredible strength. It lasts under 30 seconds, but in that amount of time, someone could still do a considerable amount of damage. The main drawback is that the juice can only be used once every 24 hours. Still, if Aethorn properly organized his army and had different ogres drink the juice at different times during battle, he'd have the kingdom on its knees. Luckily for the good people of Dunwin, only gummy bears know how to make the potion. 
And so it is that Igthorn is forever trying to capture the bears in order to get the secret of gummy berry juice. Although the Gummy Bears show does not have the same kind of tight continuity as the current binge-worthy model we see today, there is a storyline, and the characters actually learn from their experiences over the series. While Igthorn never gets close enough to the Gummies to learn any of their names, he does begin to recognize each of them and understand the role they play in their little family. Grammy is often his main target, since she is in charge of making the juice and knows the recipe the best. In another episode, he tries to bribe the ever-hungry Tummy Gummy with food in order to get into their secret home. Despite only interacting with the main six bears, Igthorn is paranoid there are many more of them in the Forest of Dunwin. While he's not entirely wrong, we do meet a handful of other gummies over the series. For the most part, it really is just these six bears that continuously thwart him. If he knew that he was only against a half dozen gummies, Igthorn would probably double down on trying to wipe them out. Juice or no juice, the Gummies have interfered with all of his plans to overthrow the kingdom. If it wasn't for these heroic bears, Igthorn would have taken over in the first couple episodes. Igthorn's backstory is something of a mystery, although we do sometimes get hints and vague references to it. The Igthorn family line is not said to be a pleasant one, with our Igthorn being a prime example. Despite this, he did somehow become a knight at one point before getting disgraced. I really wish we'd gotten a flashback to Igthorn these days. He's such a classic mustache-twirling villain, complete with an actual mustache, that I have a very hard time picturing him in a heroic role. It could be that he was faking his virtues in order to get closer to the throne. He's gone to crazier lengths to get what he wants, but I can't imagine he could keep up the nice guy act long enough to become a knight in the first place. On the other hand, he may have genuinely tried to be good at one point. In one episode, we get this exchange about his past. You were a knight once. Aren't knights supposed to honor their promises? You've been hearing too many fairy tales. Chivalry isn't what it's cracked up to be. Maybe I'm overanalyzing, but he actually sounds pretty sad. He's just been imprisoned by someone he hired, so he's already at a low point here, but I think the sadness goes beyond his current predicament. Something must have happened, but I'm afraid that's up to the fanfiction writers. The last thing we need is an official, dark origin story, where it turns out that Igthorn was always a misunderstood good guy and King Gregor was the main villain or some nonsense like that. The one exception to the evil Igthorn family is the Duke's brother, Sir Victor, also voiced by Michael Rye. He is the complete opposite of Igthorn. Think Dudley Do-Right if he was actually competent. It's through Victor that we learn Igthorn's first name, Sigmund. Apparently, his brother used to call him Siggy Soggy Shorts. There's some major sibling rivalry here. Both brothers are ashamed of each other and the path they chose in life. It's kind of tragic, but the show knows the tone it wants, and never focuses too much on this angle. It's been said that behind every great man is a greater woman. Igthorn is anything but a great man, so who's behind him? The answer is ogres. Lots and lots of ogres. One of the main reasons why Igthorn remains a threat to Dunwen is these hulking ape-like creatures that he somehow commands. And no ogre is more loyal than Little Toadwort, first voiced by Bill Scott and then Cory Burton after Scott's passing. Toadwort, also known as Toady, might look familiar if you're a fan of 80s Disney, or if you watched my previous films video. Hey, feel free to watch it again, I don't mind. Several aspects of the Gummy Bears feel like they were lifted from the Black Cauldron, along with Snow White and the Sword and Stone. Cauldron was in development at the same time as this show, but it had been on the drawing board for quite a while beforehand. It's not very hard to compare Toad Wart to the Horned King's own little punching bag, Creeper. Toady is the runt of the ogre litter, and gets kicked around a lot by the others. He is also the smartest ogre. Although he's still a pretty dim bulb, he is at least literate, which is more than the other monsters can say. It's due to his size and relative intelligence that he is the closest to Igthorn, which is not really the best position to be in. He's smart enough to be a sounding board for Igthorn's scheming, and he's small enough for Igthorn to smack him around when something goes wrong. Other times, Igthorn regards him as just a piece of furniture. Ostensibly the second in command, Toady does get to give the other ogres orders, but he gets very little respect from them. As I said, this is all very Creeper-ish, right down to his green skin. What sets Toady apart from Creeper is how durable he is, not only in body, but in spirit. Creeper is a miserable little character leading a truly wretched life under the Horned King. While Toady still takes the most abuse in the series out of all the characters, he remains pretty chipper most of the time. The logic is much more cartoon-based, and he's always able to bounce right back, even without gummy berry juice. It helps that Toady really does admire Duke Igthorn, while Creeper lived in absolute terror of the Horned King. 
Even when Toadie cowers as the Duke threatens to pummel him, you get the feeling he doesn't mind it all that much. It's an honor to be thrashed by Dunwin's future king. He's still pitiable, but Toadie takes pride in how much of a cowardly bootlegger he can be. I was first in my groveling class, am a diligent worker, and make an excellent footstool. Instead of being a one-dimensional punching bag, I like that the writers actually made Toadie a somewhat complex little character. While he does happily accept his abuse most of the time, he has a hidden resentful side that surfaces every now and then. On some level, he recognizes that he's often treated unfairly, and that there could actually be a better life for him out there. One episode had him get mistaken for a hero, and he enjoys having people actually like him. Unfortunately, he's still a selfish little ogre at heart, and Toadie quickly takes advantage of their hospitality while cowardly shirking from danger. Even as the audience, our sympathy can only go so far in these cases. In one of his best outings, Toadie accompanies Igthorn on a quest to find an invincible suit of armor. As it turns out, the armor is incredibly small and can only fit little Toadie. Igthorn uses the ogre as a secret weapon, but Toadie quickly realizes that as long as he has the armor, there's no reason why he shouldn't be in charge. Toadie becomes the new king, and is implied to be an even more ruthless monarch than Igthorn ever could have been. It's no surprise when the gummies defeat him, but it is a relief. That's not to say there isn't any good in Toadie. He does have his moments where he does the right thing, even if it's in secret. Unfortunately, his bad side almost always wins out. He's ultimately content with being a sniveling henchman, and I guess that's what really matters. The rest of the ogres are not as distinct as Toadwort. Actually, that's an understatement. They all have the same character model, the same personality, and the same voice actor, Will Ryan. The only thing to really differentiate them is their color schemes. The ogres are a generally brainless lot who enjoy simple pleasures, like stomping on flowers, kicking toady around, and eating their favorite meal, slop. There are two recurring ogres that are often seen accompanying Igthorn, a purple one named Gad, and a green one named Zook. Based on how often they work directly with Igthorn, we can assume they're fairly high-ranking members. Personality-wise, they're just the same as all the other ogres, but there's a chance that they're the tiniest bit smarter. One episode implies that most ogres are too dumb to even know their own names, putting Gad and Zook just below Toadie in terms of intelligence. Zook actually gets to play a decent role in the episode Ogre Baby Boom, where the ogres all get magically turned into babies. Grammy Gummy finds the infant Zook and assumes he's been abandoned. She decides to try raising the ogre to be a good gummy ally, only to find that ogres are naturally destructive, even as newborns. When Zook gets changed back to normal, he actually does manage to remember a few of the lessons in kindness that Grammy taught him, even protecting her from Igthorn. I'd like to think that there's hope for him, but most likely, he forgot everything he learned shortly afterward. A question you may be asking is why the ogres follow Igthorn in the first place. They are fiercely loyal to the Duke, or Dukey as they insist on calling him, and basically let him do whatever he wants to them. They understand that they can beat up on Toady because he's smaller, but they don't realize that would apply to Igthorn as well. I have a theory that authority over the ogres comes not from size or strength, but rather willpower. This is best supported when we meet Toadie's cousin, Tadpole. Voiced by Chuck McCann, Tadpole is even smaller than Toadwort. He is outraged when he sees the ogres ordered around by a human, and talks them into putting him in charge instead. As the new leader, Tadpole turns out to be even crueler than Dookie. His demands are unreasonable by ogre standards, he made them take baths for goodness sake. But none of the ogres ever think to throw him out, no matter how easy that might have been. It seems that they really like the idea of having someone to boss them around. Ichthorn may be cruel, but he does occasionally offer a kind word to his troops. If someone does something right, he'll acknowledge it, and even reward them with extra slop. These small moments of relative kindness go a long way with the ogres, and after he promises to ease up on them just a little, they put him back in charge. After so many episodes, it's understandable that even the best main villain can start to lose some steam. In Season 5, a new threat was introduced. Lady Bane, voiced by Tress McNeil. One look at Bane, and the inspiration is clear. Her appearance is lifted almost directly from Snow White's evil queen. She also has the queen's vanity, but her temper, especially around her hapless minions, comes from Maleficent. Her face, meanwhile, is inconsistent. Sometimes it resembles the queen, but other times, mostly when she's angry, it contorts into a more exaggerated Maleficent face. Lady Bane is also after the gummy bears, but she has her sights set on something far more valuable than their juice recipe. She wants all their magical secrets. Given the immense power that the sorceress already has, 
It would be absolutely devastating if she got her claws on gummy magic. She already has a gummy medallion, which glows whenever a bear is nearby. Her final episode reveals that the witch is actually far older than she looks. Every hundred years, she casts a spell using a lock of hair from a youth. Her victim grows old, while Bane stays young. We still don't know her true age, a lady never tells, but I wonder if perhaps Lady Bane was one of the greedy humans who drove the gummy bears away in the first place. This character benefits from appearing less often. She shows up enough to establish that she's definitely a threat, but doesn't get defeated enough to get too comedic like Igthorn. Speaking of Dookie, he's head over heels in love with the sorceress. Lady Bane tolerates him at best, and even then only when she can use him to further her own goals. She thinks the Kingdom of Dunwin is quaint and not really worth her time. The only episode where she actually goes after the Kingdom is when King Gregor slights her. Again, there's that Maleficent influence. For the whole series, Ichthorn constantly jumps between being intimidating and funny, mostly the latter. Whenever he's around Lady Bane, he loses any bite he ever had. If you want to see Ichthorn at his weakest, and funniest, look for one of their interactions. One of my personal favorite episodes has Ichthorn try to use a love potion on her. Of course, it backfires, and Lady Bane falls in love with Toadwort. Despite not being affected by the potion, Toadie seems awfully happy with the situation. I appreciate the unique design of Bane's castle. Instead of having a classic, ominous hideout like Igthorn's Dreckmore estate, her castle is absolutely gaudy. The proportions are off-kilter, and everything is covered in tacky pink hearts. It doesn't exactly scream Evil Enchantress, but it signals that whoever's living here is probably not quite right. Lady Bane's underlings serve the same purpose as Igthorn's ogres. These creatures are called troggles, and are best described as gremlin jackals. Their English is limited to parroting the last word someone has just said. They definitely appear to be a devious bunch at a glance, but I find myself feeling much sorrier for them than I do for the ogres. The ogres get pushed around a lot, but they're all pretty durable. They're too stupid to recognize when Igthorn insults them, and they can withstand a lot of abuse. The troggles are smaller, and seem truly scared when Lady Bane threatens them. Find that balmy bear and bring him to me, or I'll turn you and your little friends into mushrooms! 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 <laughs> It's not clear if she ever carries out these threats, because the Troggles all look alike. We could be seeing a different set of monsters each time. I really wonder how many Troggles Lady Bane has gone through over the series. A last interesting note about the Troggles. The Love Potion episode I mentioned implies they're all female. During Toadie's wild ogre bachelor party, the Troggles entertain the troops while dressed in grass skirts and shell bras. Later at the wedding, most of them are dressed as bridesmaids. It makes Lady Bane and her ilk a nice contrast to the Sausage Fest over at Dreckmore. While Igthorn and Lady Bane made up the biggest threats the Gummies faced, the series had plenty of other villains. As I'll be doing for most shows, I want to keep the focus on the recurring bad guys as opposed to the one-shot characters. A group of trolls appeared a few times as expert thieves. While they were small in size, they ended up being surprisingly dangerous. Their first episode had eight trolls acting as highwaymen. The way the knights talked about them made it clear that they viewed these creatures as a serious threat. By the end, the trolls are all rounded up and arrested. The other troll episodes open with three trolls escaping the dungeon, only to be recaptured at the end. These three are given names and personalities, although they never develop into truly distinct characters. The leader is Clutch, voiced by Cory Burton. He's small but ruthless, armed with some sort of shooter that can be loaded with walnuts or peas. Being a kid-targeted show, the shooter is treated like a deadly weapon. The other trolls are Nip and Tuck, voiced by Paul Winchell and Michael Rye. Jim Cummings took over for Winchell in Tuck's final appearance. In cartoon bad guy group tradition, these two are dim-witted followers of Clutch, with little needs or wants of their own. They really chose the wrong leader, since Clutch will gladly betray them if it means getting away with whatever loot they're hunting. The trolls' M.O. is stealing of any kind. Whether it's robbing coaches, pilfering gummy machines, or breaking into the royal treasury, they're happiest when they're taking something from someone. It's no wonder King Gregor is so intent on keeping them in the dungeon. This does raise a question. The trolls are criminals, but why are they in the dungeon when Ichthorn regularly goes three? Gregor has had chances to imprison the evil duke many times, but he always sends him back to Dreckmore instead. Some of that is for story reasons. If Ichthorn is captured, there will be less chances to use their main villain. A non-meta theory could be that the king worries Ichthorn's ogres could try to break their leader out, but the chances of this are slim. The ogres are clueless without their dookie to boss them around, and even Toadwort would have trouble coming up with a good escape plan. 
That, and Igthorn could easily have come up with a plan where he got captured on purpose in order to get on the inside. Everyone probably feels much better keeping him as far away from the castle as possible. But enough theorizing about Igthorn, our focus is on the trolls. As I said, each episode with the trolls ends with them getting sent back to the dungeon. Except for their final appearance. This time, they're simply chased off by one of their angry, would-be victims. The trolls are not the most likable or engaging villains we've seen, but I kind of like that they ended up escaping in the end, even if it was empty-handed. The final recurring villains to cover are the monstrous Carpies, a race of hideous vultures. Their appearance and mannerisms remind me a bit of the Skeksis from The Dark Crystal. That movie had come out not too long before the Gummy Bears aired, so it was probably fresh in the crew's minds. The Carpies only appeared in two episodes, and both times had poor Sunny Gummy as their main victim. In fact, their second appearance seemed to largely echo their first, and I'm actually not sure how intentional this was. Either they had a narrative throughline going, or they felt like reworking an earlier episode and hoped no one would notice. In their first appearance, the story concerns Sunny wanting to be a famous singer. There must be a monkey's paw nearby, because she's kidnapped by the Carpies to be their king's personal songbird. That means she's put in a cage and forced to sing non-stop to the point of exhaustion. Based on the king's remarks, his songbirds never last all that long. The second Carpy episode has Sunny once again wishing for something greater than a solitary gummy life. This time, she wants to be royalty, like her good friend Princess Kala. Kala warns Sunny that being a princess isn't as glamorous as it appears, and Sunny learns this firsthand when she gets kidnapped by the Carpies again. Due to a misunderstanding, they believe she's defeated their king in battle, and make her their new queen. Sunny is delighted at first, but soon realizes that the Carpies have the maturity levels of bratty children, and feels more like a babysitter than a monarch. The Carpies as a whole are not really evil, just unruly. Their king, voiced by Will Ryan, is the only one who's entirely wicked. He calls the shots, and dishes out harsh punishments to anyone who disobeys him or sets off his temper. He's perfectly willing to try to kill Sunny after she escapes being a songbird. He doesn't seem to remember her in their second encounter, which is definitely a good thing for the little bear. I'm not against villains finding redemption as long as it's done well. They tease this idea when the king gets injured by a flying tummy. Don't ask. The gummies nurse his broken wing back to health and make him a beak warmer, something he always wanted. This is enough to bring tears to the old buzzer's eyes. It appears for a second that the Grinch's heart has grown three sizes, but then the king tries to enslave the bears instead. I don't like to say that someone is a lost cause, but the king isn't doing himself any favors. As I said, the other Carpies are more impulsive and thoughtless than actually evil. Given the limited intelligence of his underlings, the Carpy King lashes out at them on a near-constant basis. Like Igthorn's ogres calling him Dookie, the other Carpies all call their king Kingy. A recurring theme we've seen in almost every villain group in the Gummy Bears is the reasonably intelligent boss saddled with a bunch of very stupid lackeys. I realize that's not exclusive to this show, and is in fact a Saturday morning cartoon staple. It just really sticks out to me after watching all these episodes in a short amount of time, and then summarizing the characters. I did notice that the Carpies seemed a lot dumber in their second and final appearance. The dumbest of them is Bobo, a character definitely based on Warner Brothers' Beaky Buzzard. He may be the dimmest bulb, but he has the biggest heart. Sunny ends up crowning him their new king, which will hopefully encourage the birds to behave themselves. Given that the dethroned king swears vengeance, it's anyone's guess on how long Bobo's reign will last. Bobo is voiced by Frank Welker, and the various other Carpies are voiced by June Foray and Jim Cummings. You may have picked up on the fact that more than half the characters we've discussed feel like they were derived from someone else. It's not just the villains, either. Cavan seems like a cross between Arthur and Taran, with an emphasis on both the characters' good points. Princess Kala feels like a more successful version of what they were attempting with Princess Ilanwi. The dynamic between Zummy and Gruffy often feels like Doc and Grumpy, or perhaps Merlin and Archimedes. And that's just a few characters, the list really goes on. Even though Adventures of the Gummy Bears may not have been 100% original, it still had its own unique flavor. It used these inspirations as a jumping off point, not as a crutch. I wish it was a little more fondly remembered the same way that DuckTales or Rescue Rangers are. Before we move on to our last group of villains, we should touch on Igthorn and the Ogre's appearances outside the series. Only a few Gummy Bears comic stories were printed, but they're pretty funny. They remind me just a bit of the Asterix series, which is most definitely a compliment. The focus was on humor rather than adventure. I noticed that the Ogres, who normally talk like cartoon cavemen, speak with perfect grammar in these stories. 
When it comes to TV shows, theme park representation is usually slim. The Gummy Bears all received walk-around costumes, but the villains were not as lucky. That doesn't mean they never appeared at all, though. Disneyland. 1991. The section of Fantasyland near It's a Small World became Disney Afternoon Avenue. Characters like Launchpad and the Beagle Boys roamed around, and various temporary attractions sprang up. One of these was the Motorboat Cruise to Gummy Glen. The old motorboat ride received plywood figures of gummy bears and ogres. A nearby play area also featured a plywood Igthorn. It's not much, but I'm happy to scrape the bottom of the gummy berry barrel to find just a bit more of Dookie and his minions. The last series we'll be covering isn't really a series at all. Instead, it was a failed pilot from 1986, Fluffy Dogs. Taking more cues from My Little Pony and Pound Puppies, the show was meant to tie into a recently launched toy line. The titular Fluffies were a group of cute, cuddly, pastel-colored dogs. In addition to plushes, a few children's books were already on the market. These were generally easy-going, low-conflict stories, with the main message being, wouldn't you like a fluffy dog? Again, very typical material for the time period. And I'll admit, they are pretty cute. The TV show intended to take a more adventurous direction, giving the puppies the ability to jump between dimensions with a magical crystal key. At the beginning of the pilot, we find five of the dogs lost in an unknown wasteland, somehow displaced from their home world and trying to find a way back. A couple more dimension hops lead the dogs to our world, where they wind up in the pound. As expected, the Fluppies make a few friends and a few foes in this new world. Jamie and Claire are a couple kids who try to help the dogs find their way back home, while the villain, J.J. Wagstaff, intends to add them to his rare animal collection. I appreciate that Wagstaff has a very reasonable reaction to seeing these fantastic creatures. This way! That dog talked! <laughs> that dog talked! The show hits a few of the same beats as Gummy Bears. We have two kids keeping the secret of a race of cute mythical animals, while the villain seeks to capture them. Wagstaff is even voiced by Michael Rye, doing a somewhat similar voice to the one he did for Ichthorn. Instead of his power coming from brute strength, cunning, and an army of ogres, Wagstaff has the entire city under his thumb. We never find out what exactly he does outside of being a generic business tycoon, but based on how the police and mayor do whatever he says, it's clear that this man is in charge. He only has one direct underling, the mild-mannered Hamish, voiced by Hal Smith. Wagstaff's passion is for collecting exotic animals. Some of them are kept in uncomfortable-looking cages, while others are mounted and stuffed. When he finds out that the legendary Fluffy Dogs exist, he becomes dead set on capturing them. When he does manage to nab one of the dogs, he needs it to talk to prove it's truly a Fluffy. Never mind the green fur. He goes so far as to threaten the pup with his pet snake, Lucy, who looks like she's always hungry. Based on the cruel treatment we see of his animals, Wagstaff only cares about having them, not taking care of them. Hamish, meanwhile, actually seems to like the animals and does his best to treat them with kindness. Neither character gets developed beyond this, given that we only have the pilot. As the story winds down, the dogs do manage to get back to their homeworld, a snowy wonderland full of glowing crystals. Wagstaff, Hamish, and Lucy wind up getting stuck there as well, with their ultimate fate being left in the air. The ending shows the dogs returning to our world for more adventures, but no sign of the villains. Would Wagstaff have become a recurring villain if the series was picked up? Hard to say. DeviantArt user Cartoon Loving Feline bought the story bible from eBay, which goes into detail on how the show would have progressed. There were a few villains proposed, but Wagstaff is not mentioned. The bad guys we never got included Professor Woolsey, who was obsessed with capturing rare animals, and Susan Sacron, the world's worst reporter, along with her sidekick, a cameraman named Lenscap. I assume Woolsey would have played a similar role to Wagstaff, and Sacron would have been constantly trying to expose the dogs. I can't find a definitive reason as to why Floppy Dogs was never picked up as a full series outside of low ratings. Personally, I felt it was a little too bland, aside from the dimension hopping. I talked about how Gummy Bears was often derivative of other projects, but it managed to find its own voice beyond that. This pilot? Not so much. It felt derivative of Gummy Bears itself, but without anything else to help it stand on its own two feet. The Floppies are cute but not as fun as the Gummies, and Wagstaff is nowhere near as engaging or entertaining as Igthorn. Still, I'm happy to have covered it and given it a little more attention than it's received over the years. That concludes the first of many trips to the small screen.
We're heading back to theaters next to cover one of my personal favorites. For a mouse detective to be truly great, they need an equally great adversary. And no one is greater than Professor Radigan. No! No! Not again! I won't be stopped by two children and a handful of mythological bears! 